my connection, our community's connection to Patagonia is the fact that our ancestors used to live in the area, probably since about 300 BC through 1400 AD, and then again about a, a hundred years later. For us as all of them, I can only speak from that perspective, is that we've always been taught by our ancestors, our forefathers, that in order to be able to survive, we need to realize that we as humans are not apart from nature. We are part of nature. The American Southwest is a land of exquisite beauty. In order to promote settlement and commerce during the 1800s, the federal government created the 1872 Mining Law. The law allows removal of minerals, including gold, silver, and copper, on federal lands for free. Located in the mountains of southern Arizona is the small town of Patagonia. Rich in minerals, Patagonia was extensively mined up until the 1960s. By then, most of the mines were abandoned, leaving behind a legacy of toxic chemicals and polluted water. Due to the abundance of rare birds, animals, and breathtaking scenery, Patagonia reinvented itself as a popular eco-tourist destination. Today, international industrialized mining has reappeared, enabled by the antiquated 1872 mining law, which allows foreign corporations to remove minerals from public land without paying royalties. These international corporations threaten the wildlife, the economy, and the beauty. One of the biggest challenges that the mining companies have is exiting the mine sites. They are about six to ten miles outside of town on rural roads that have been two-lane roads. Mining companies came here. The town was concerned about the amount of trucks that would come through the town or possibly come through the town. Um, the mining company has very little options in terms of getting out of their location. It's, it's pretty isolated, so they can go out the back way, which is 22 miles of winding dirt roads that brings them out to Highway 82 near Nogales, or they can come 10 miles on a paved road through town. And so this was a great concern for us. A large concentrate ore truck would typically be expected to come into the range of about 40 tons. And just think of the biggest truck you can imagine. And that's the concept of what these trucks are. They're very large, they're very heavy. The other concern is what's going to be delivered to the mine site. Mine production requires the use of significant chemicals. Your mine is eight or nine miles from town due south and to bring the product through a neighborhood and a community causing impacts, whether it's a diesel engine, electric motor, whatever it is, vehicles on roads are noisy. It just didn't seem appropriate to have that type of industrial roadway system running through neighborhoods and a community. This will impact people's safety, their their property values, the ability to live in peace and quiet in this beautiful area. I travel for my work and I came home after a couple of weeks trip and um, found that the uh, property all around us had been purchased by the mine. Well, we thought this was very underhanded that they were saying they're going to be transparent, um, but clearly you know, in literally in a matter of two or three weeks we're buying uh, millions of dollars of, of land, not telling one landowner what they were up to. And in fact, it was a 
third party, so people didn't even know they were selling to the mines. When the mine began purchasing properties from people who don't live here, um, and then large swaths of land, and then began purchasing from people in a position where they needed to sell their property, it, it really started tearing at the fabric of our relationships and the integrity, uh, the cohesiveness of this community. I think everyone that has sold to the mine has reservations. The proposed road by South 32 Mine, we actually went out there. We were shown the two sites that they had discovered at that time. The laws that protect our burial grounds and sacred sites and associated funerary objects is a federal law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. That act provides for Native nations, tribes, to be able to have the items that were taken from our respective uh, reservations, ancestral lands, they are then repatriated back to us. If there are individuals who break that law, there are penalties for them to abide by, but we are grateful that we do have the information that they supply to us, and I know down the road we will be able to inform them as to how we would like to have those particular sites treated. Our first option is always that the remains, the sacred sites, should remain undisturbed. As long as they abide by the protocols, then it, they probably would be able to build a road. However, um, we may strongly voice that they remain undisturbed, and I would hope that that has some impact in, you know, having them reconsider. Red Rock Acres is this part highlighted in yellow, and the pink shows all of the purchases that South 32 made last summer. It would look like they own their way out. If they had all of these four pieces, they could very easily come off Harshaw Road, cross through this property, and then join their other property that goes out to uh, 82 without any problem. And we know that everyone in these pieces has been approached by the mine to purchase their land. We had a seller who was anxious not to sell to the mine. At that point, uh, it appeared, looking at the parcel that was for sale, that the mine's route could be blocked by that one lot being purchased by a different party. It, it was just thrilling for us to be able to think, well, maybe we can do something here and maybe it will help our cause. We approached everybody in Red Rock Acres to see if they would support this um, purchase because obviously uh, we are some of the people most directly affected by this potential road. And we also approached all of the property owners along the route. We also had some significant support from people who don't live along the route, but who live in Patagonia and cherish this place. I think that really showed the mine in the purchase of that property that we're not messing around, that all these locals really care about what's happening in the Patagonia Mountains and that we're all willing to come together and put down our own time and money to invest in solutions to make sure that the mine doesn't end up going through the town of Patagonia, doesn't end up disrupting local life or wildlife. South 32 is a spinoff from the largest mining company in Australia, uh, one of the largest mining companies in the world. Um, and South 32 has access to enormous resources, uh, technical resources and financial resources. And to South 32, buying a few million dollars worth of, of land is, um, is uh, no big deal. Um, but for a group of local citizens to raise 60 or $70,000 to buy one little lot is a big deal. So we really did see this as being a David and Goliath kind of confrontation. Um, very much outmatched by uh, um, the uh, resources and power that the, the mine had. And we knew that if we were going to be successful, we had to be strategic.
Our educational programs consist of five different programs targeted to skill build for the youth and connect them to um, transferable skills that then can inspire them and lead them into uh, conservation careers in the future. The big program that we run is a summer program where we pay youth to restore their home watersheds. High school students in this community go through summer programs where they're paid $15 an hour to learn how to do restoration techniques and some of them go on to permanent jobs. We've actually had hundreds of jobs come out of this restoration economy in contrast to very few local residents who get paid to be part of the mining exploration. Yearly, we're probably reaching 150 participants. My, one of my big goals is that the young people who go through this program, after really understanding the natural world and understanding this place and understanding the culture of place, can really make informed, good decisions about how natural resources are managed. The environmental protection industry is growing. Uh, there is a lot of work to do. There is a lot of uh, repairing of the earth and our natural resources that now we need to focus on, uh, especially with global warming being more of a threat now than it has been before. Um, and I think it's becoming more and more of a priority for a lot of different industries. When I like started reading more about the environmental stuff yeah. we would be doing, I got excited because I do feel strongly about it, but I haven't done much like research about it back home, so I don't know that much about like what I can bring back okay. home with me, and so now I will. Patagonia and the Patagonia Mountains and Lake Patagonia have at least 30,000 eco-tourists that come here per year that provide about 6.5 to $7 million a year to the local economy, 75 to 100 direct salaried and seasonal wage jobs that the Nature Conservancy, Audubon Society, Game and Fish, International Hummingbird Network, Native Seed Search, Borderlands Restoration, Wildlife Corridor, and Borderlands Restoration Network pay. With all the jobs that are promised, no one's really talking about the jobs that might be lost. So in Arizona, there's 13.5 billion dollars per year uh, economic gain through outdoor recreation, and that's more gain economically than all of the mining economy in all of the state. We need to be talking about more than the small number of jobs that might be created by the mine, and also be raising questions about what we stand to lose in this economy. I don't see where the mine is benefiting the people in Patagonia. Most of the people that are working for the mine are not from town. The constant flow of mine trucks is obnoxious, um, plus heavy equipment trucks, plus gravel trucks, plus concrete trucks, plus gas trucks, plus everything. Very few local residents who get paid to be part of the mining exploration. Most of them are wildcat operators that come in for one to three months from other states and don't leave any positive imprint on the community. You couldn't imagine a worse place, first to put the mine, and secondly, to put the roads uh, to carry the ore out of the mine. If you look at the distribution of rare and endangered species in the U.S., there are three or four places, that we call them hotspots, uh, that have unusually high numbers of uh, threatened species. And we're in the heart of one of those places. Mining activity is activity which is not compatible with the protection of those species. The way you rank the rarity of, of species, ones that are protected in the law or candidates to be protected, one of the systems is called the G ranks. And species that have G ranks of one, two, and three are either extinct, endangered, or uh, very threatened, the highest level of threat. Most of the U.S. has zero to one, G1 to G3 species. The mountains right around the Patagonia area have two to three hundred G1 to G3 species occurrences and are by far more biologically diverse than almost anywhere else in the, in the U.S.
if it's going to impact us, then we should have a say in that. It's certainly going to impact the, the voiceless critters that, that live in this area. For United States citizens, as taxpayers, we take a large hit on both ends of mining company activity in this country. Up front, when these foreign mining companies come in, they are allowed to remove the minerals from the ground for free. It is estimated that it is billions of dollars of material that comes out of the ground here that no royalties are paid on. These mining companies need to begin to pay for the materials that they are extracting. On the back end, we as taxpayers also are on the hook for damages left behind. The history is mining companies go bankrupt. Do you have any idea of how much water you'll be pulling out of the ground over the course of four years? Are we talking billions of gallons? If the water is depleted by the mine, it's going to have not only an, an effect and impact on the biodiversity of the mountains, tourism, the different habitats, animals that call that area their home, but it's going to impact a lot of the communities surrounding the area directly. Here in Patagonia, a lot of households use wells to access their, their water. Drilling down even further usually costs a lot of money and if people aren't able to afford to drill down their wells or they just simply don't have access to water that could potentially cause a lot of lower income households to have to move to Tucson to have to move to Nogales um, so I think the impact goes way beyond uh, the direct environmental harm that the mine is going to cause. South 32 using 1.6 billion gallons of water. I think it's really a waste of good quality water and it would certainly harm the aquifer if they're going to pull out that much water and and of course the Patagonia residents uh, I'm sure would be affected. I think uh, mines should just stay out of areas where it's pristine. It's safeguarded for future generations. Any time that folks come together in collective with a common aim and leverage their resources, which don't have to be, you know, tangible monetary resources, but people's skills and passions, and put that together strategically, that a small group of people can actually have an incredible impact. And even against major corporate entities, uh, HIV AIDS history, and you're talking about folks who were um, highly marginalized because of their identities and because of some of the myths that we had about HIV early in the epidemic. And they were battling major um, corporate interests in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. And yet, despite that, over just you know five to 10 years, we're able to get a seat at the table in decision making at the highest levels of government, US government, um, with the US Presidential Council, within the FDA, even on pharmaceutical boards. So though we're in a David and Goliath battle, which I think is, is important to acknowledge, there's histories upon histories of these battles 
where groups, collectives have been able to come together and strategically have incredible successes. And that inspires me to realize that change is possible. And there's so much people can do concretely. I mean, from calling the Forest Service or writing to them when there are open commentary periods to um, contacting the mine and asking them why they haven't given uh, the funding for water studies, uh, attending local fora, um, writing op-ed letters, you know, raising our voices, using all of the strategies that the history of social movements tells us um, work when we come together as a community to resist. People who care about the land and wildlife and water, who choose a career in activism, know that it's going to be a long fight, that it's not going to be something that's, that instantly makes things better. Um, it, is, it is something, though, that needs to be done. And I, I think people in my generation are coming into activism knowing that we have a big slog ahead of us. You know, the alternative is I just don't do anything, that we don't do anything, that we just sit by and say, well, I guess we can't fight you, so we're going to let you do what you do, and you're going to impact us, and we're just going to take it. So when you have right on your side, as is the case here, where literally there's violence being inflicted on the mountains around here, on the planet around here, on the environment in the Patagonia region, when right is on your side and you organize, nothing can stop you and eventually you'll get wins. Well, one of the things that occurred uh, as a meeting with the top official with the Army Corps of Engineers, we expressed to him both the Pahnautam Nation, the Pasquayaki tribe, and the Hopi uh, tribe representatives express the need for Rosemont to not be uh, completed and that the area that they were looking at needs to remain intact as is because of our uh, cultural affiliation to the land. It's part of our ancestral lands as Tahna Atam. And uh, so having uh, that voice with, with the top person, for that person to make a decision, the right decision, based on what the local uh, people want to see is important. Your voice does matter. Companies that are attractive to people who have an interest in social and environmental values are the ones who have learned that they need to take into consideration not just the profit that they're making, but the cost that uh, society as a whole has to hold based on their activities. If their business model is one that does not account for the costs, whether that's pollution or something else, then those externalities are borne by someone else, by taxpayers, by people, by the planet. Over the past 10 to 15 years, the field of social finance and impact investing has grown immensely. Investors pay attention to what people in communities are saying about the companies that are working there. Those voices are as important as the voices that are coming directly out of the companies speaking about what they're doing. Part of their, their project to their investors and everything else is to show that, you know, the town loves them. The mining company does not want concerns being voiced loud enough that local press, regional press, national press, and worldwide press becomes aware of it. They've been met with opposition from the beginning, uh, particularly from defenders of wildlife and the uh, local PARA, the or organization that has organized itself to protect the land and fight the mine. Patagonia Area Resource Alliance and Defenders of Wildlife sued the Forest Service over environmental concerns on a number of projects and had successful outcomes. In 2014, Patagonia Area Resource Alliance and Earthworks did an analysis of the proposed open pit mine, helping change it to an underground one. Since 2015, Borderlands Restoration Network and its partner organization, Wildlife Corridors, have purchased almost 1,600 acres of pristine land. 
This protected area will provide safe haven for wildlife, now known as Borderlands Wildlife Preserve. In 2021, Wildlife Corridors was awarded a $1.09 million grant to connect wildlife habitats, enhance biodiversity, and foster climate resilience. South 32 was planning to build a passive water treatment plant for $3 million. Patagonia Area Resource Alliance hired experts to critique the plan, submitting it to the state, who then required an active water treatment facility costing South 32 $25 million. The town of Patagonia passed a truck ordinance limiting the number of trucks going through town. Arizona Minerals challenged that ordinance, bringing it to the Attorney General, who ruled in favor of the town. These are small victories that make a difference. These mining companies do not expect this level of local resistance. Right now uh, in the, the U.S. is about 5% of the world's population and we're responsible for about 33% of the world's consumption and nearly half of the world's waste. So when we hear we have to keep drilling, we have to keep mining, we have to keep you know, uh, taking things out of the earth for our consumption, do we have to? Maybe the thing that should most be extracted from Patagonia is the fact that people here live more simply than mm -hmm. in most places, that people here are much more careful about their material worlds and their material ways. Maybe that's what we should extract. Well, today the South 32 Mining Company has set up a Skype meeting with a few people here in Red Rock Acres, and we think that this is the preferred exit for their ore trucks, so we're all on pins and needles waiting to hear. I built a house here in 1992, and to have these huge trucks rumbling by, the roads torn up, and we're the first house in this neighborhood, so I would be severely impacted in a very bad way. I had heard the frustration from people that, you know, the mine can just walk in and it can buy anything it wants. We can at least show that there is some um, there's some opposition, really quite strong opposition to this in the community. The group that came together uh, said, we may, we may not stop the road. It's, it is an impediment um, and hopefully uh, maybe over time we can figure out a way to create a few more impediments to uh, make this a very difficult place to put a road system. And I'm hoping that the mining company goes that's an interesting message. It's clear to me that South 32 was not thinking about proximity to local residents and the impacts that this route would have on a local community when they decided to announce this route. So the meeting was a confirmation that it will come right by our residential neighborhood. When I heard that this was their choice, it uh, basically it made me feel uh, very sad and, and somewhat angry to be so helpless in the face of corporate greed. <laughs> when they included all of this information like it was a done deal and wouldn't we be happy to work with them to put artwork along the wall and choose plants that grow there and it just seemed very condescending and smarmy, dishonest really. I wish our priorities would be less around profits and the bottom line and a little bit more about quality and, and life, but that doesn't seem to be our values right now. So I think we need to change our values. The, the mindset has been that, you know, to survive, you need to take care of the plant life, the animal life. And for us as all of them, culturally, we, we are tied to this land because we have a ceremony when we're born as infants, we are fed a ceremonial mud and prayers are offered. And so when we ingest that ceremonial mud, we are tied to Mother Earth. If we're to believe the maps and the engineering studies that they presented to us in August, they were able to avoid that little piece of land that we purchased and still put in their road.
The way that a large international commercial mining company or oil drilling company, the way they operate is they come into an area, third world country or a sleepy little town in southern Arizona, and they offer maybe jobs or wages. If you've ever wondered what colonialism feels like, those of us living in this community understand what it is like to have a significant, well-moneyed force show up on your doorstep and try to get their way. A quote I love by Adrian Rich where she more or less says, you know, she says so much has been lost and that's true, but she says I have to cast my lot with those who age after age perversely and with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world. And that's kind of the history of social movements and to think that if we just cast our lot with each other as fellow human beings in this work and in this fight, um, that we, ha we there's so much that we stand to win.